Welcome to Thinking Green. Uh, those of you who have watched the show uh, know that especially since the last election, we've been focusing as much as possible on uh, institutions that we've come to value in our country that are, seem to be under attack right now. So uh, tonight's guests are, are from the Public Library of New London. Uh, and I do think it, it's fair to say the libraries are perhaps a threatened institution in, in today's day. Um, my guests are Suzanne Marieski, who's the executive director of the Public Library of New London, and Deneen Roth, who is the president of the Board of Trustees. They have been on before, but welcome back. Well, thank you very much for having us again, Rana. It's always a pleasure to be here. Well, thanks for coming on. And I know we've been talking about getting together, well, since November. But it sounds as though waiting has almost been a good thing because there's a lot of new stuff happening. So um, before you start talking about library programs, I thought I'd ask each of you, like, how did you get involved with the library? Uh, and how did you get involved with the New London Library? You All right, Suzanne, you can begin. <laughs> well, uh, I guess I could go back to fifth grade when there weren't libraries in the, in the school. The, there was a collection in each room, and I was a librarian. I kept track of the books in our, in our so little So really, room. it was just a, a mission. Since <laughs> you've been 10, you've been a librarian. <laughs> right. My first job was working at the Summit Reading Program in the Waterford Public Library, and then it just went on. And I think I'm the luckiest person to have a job that I, I've loved every step of the way. And uh, this... This is my favorite job I've ever had, to be the director of the Public Library of New London. It's, it's such an important institution, and I feel like it really makes New London a better city. It's a um, cornerstone of the city. It reflects what the city thinks of itself, how it supports its library. And I think we're, we're coming along in that way. Well, and how long have you been at the library? It's, seven, it's a long time it's now. It's a long time now. I can't believe it. It's gone so fast. I wish there were seven more years, but I'm, I'm sure there won't be. But. There will be a few more years. I, I hope imagine. so. Well, um. <laughs> and um, I got involved with the library, as most young kids do. Uh, I lived in Waterford at the time, and when I was old enough to ride my bike from our house to what was then the Waterford Public Library, the small little park house, which was not on Jordan Green at that time, it was on the corner there of Great Neck Road. Oh, I would I ride didn't know there. That. Oh yes, that building was moved. Uh, I would ride there and get some books, and Miss Harwood, who had been there since the library had been built, helped us and so on. Um, but then in my adult years, after I moved to New London, I had a friend call up and say to me one night, would you be interested in working on the um, Board of Trustees for the Public Library of New London? We don't really do that much. Um, <laughs> I've, I've forgiven her for that. Um, for that um, kind of embroidery of the truth, let's say. <laughs> uh, but I was glad to do that because the library is something that serves everyone. And especially today, the library is so much more than what it used to be. In the days that I would ride my bike and you would tiptoe around the library and it was mostly books and that was it. Nowadays, li libraries are vital places and lively places and places where all kinds of things take place and where you can borrow all kinds of things that were just unimaginable in those days. Yeah, it's kind of been a slow and gradual uh, evolution because I remember when my own kids were, were young, now they're in their 40s, uh, that libraries had just were starting to be places where you didn't just go into the adult room or the children's room and have to be quiet. They were starting to have computers and meeting rooms and you know, story hours and things like that. But we've gone so far since in the last 30 years. It, it's really evolved further. So um, well, do you want to... You mentioned meeting rooms, and that's a, such an important part of the library today, a place where people can come together and talk about things, issues. We have a lot of, you know, meetings from the city or just meetings of other groups, nonprofit groups that want to advanced things. We have debates in there. So it's got a much higher profile in that area than it used to, as you said. And that really is important because as someone who's participated in, you know, debates and community programs, there aren't really a lot of good public spaces that are pleasant, that are easily accessible, that 
can host play things like that. Right. No, for sure. And it's nonpartisan. It doesn't have uh, any bias to it the way you might go somewhere and that you could be reflecting the point of view of the place that's there. But we want everyone to come. And we have had it. Both sides of the political spectrum, both right. things. It's wonderful. And sometimes all the sides all in the same room at the same <laughs> time. <laughs> it makes it lively. It does. Um, we're getting some wireless mics for the next um, debate, so we'll be happy to have that. Okay. Well, I will not be involved. <laughs> you heard it here first. I, uh, but, yes, yeah, so um, maybe you can talk a little bit about, uh, you know, the facilities there, and then we can talk about the programs, because I know you have some really long-standing programs, but the list keeps getting longer, and there are new ones as well. Well, we have two very new services I really would like to talk about while maybe the sure. audience is the biggest. One thing is our, our mobile hotspots, which means it's, it's, it's uh, wireless access that you can take around with you for mm. people that don't have internet in their home or if you're going somewhere and you know that you won't have it, have it there, you can borrow a, a device from us. We just got our third one this week. We have three. Wow. They're constantly out, but New London residents can put a hold on, and they go out for one week at a time. So that's fantastic. So a person can real, can just borrow it the way they borrow a book or a movie. Exactly. You need mm -hmm. a, an up-to-date library card. Uh, there's no charge at this point. But if it gets lost, there's a hefty fee. But we don't expect them to get lost. They haven't so far. People respect it. You can't put it back in the book drop because it's a piece of technology. But they've been extremely popular for everyone. So we're happy to be able to do that. And it's unlimited data. So when you have it, you can do, you know, have your your phone or whatever you want to run from it and not have to worry about paying for data. So we're very happy to offer that to the people in New London. And it sounds like the people of New London are very thrilled to be able to have access to that. Right. And once in a while, the staff will take it. If we're going out for outreach, because one thing we've really added a lot in the last year is outreach, where we go out into the community, events at schools or social events or just sitting in front of the barber shop on, on State Street during Library Card Month. If you have that with you, we can access the internet with, through our computer to check things. So it's good for the staff, but really we hardly ever use it compared to patrons. We're happy for that. And it also gives the, the folks in New London who don't have internet access a chance to have internet access in their homes. They come to the library to use our computers right. when they can, but we close very early. We close at 7 o'clock at night, and on Wednesdays we're not open until 1 o'clock in the afternoon. So naturally, if you have that hot spot, you can do whatever work you have to do from where whatever location sure. you're in. So it, it's a great convenience for people who ordinarily wouldn't have access. And internet access in your home is not inexpensive. It certainly isn't, no. no. And a lot of people do have uh, smartphones, but they, they work a lot faster if you have some good data there. This, we were able to um, get the uh, hotspots through a, our uh, Connecticut Library Consortium, which is a consortium of libraries across Connecticut, and they got a really good deal. I won't mention the name of the um, supplier <laughs> on here, but, uh, but anytime you're buying in a group, and the, and the data plan is that we can afford it. We consider it's money well spent. It's not that expensive. So we're happy about that. Wow, that's fantastic. Yeah. So what else is new? One more thing, which we just got today, so this is really hot news, is the Mango databases to learn, uh, in, to learn different languages. There are 71 languages you can learn with it. And I was a bit skeptical at first, thinking, oh, well, you can use Duolingo on your phone for free, so why are we going to spend money on this? But when you explore what is available from Mango, it's unbelievable. And to the resident of New London who came to me last year and said, Suzanne, I go to Waterford Library and I can use this. Mm -hmm. You know, why can't we have it? Now we have it, so please come. It's, it's so how does it work? Well, first of all, it's authenticated by your library card. So you need a New London library card. That's why our New London resident who is in Waterford could probably use it there, but she couldn't use it when she came home. So it, it works. It's, um, it has unbelievable languages. We were, we were looking at that a little bit. Yeah, it was a long list. A and long I, was, mm -hmm. I was sort of impressed that there were two different Hebrews, uh, <laughs> present day and biblical, because it isn't as though there are so many people in the world who speak Hebrew, uh, although maybe there are more who uh, read the Bible. But I would imagine learning to read it would be task enough, too. Yeah, well, I don't know. Uh, it might be. I went to Hebrew, started Hebrew school when I was in mm -hmm. second grade. And as you know, when kids are young, 
these things seem easier. And it's not a complicated language, it's just very different from English. Mm -hmm. right. In fact, it's got hardly any vocabulary. It's, uh, an educated oh. Israeli will know every single word in the language. Right. And That's I don't right. think you can that. say that like in English. Well, no, English that, has no. the most words of any language. <laughs> so yeah, you can be quite well wit educated and there's a lot we still don't know. Wow, that's impressive. So what other languages are available? Well, what I was impressed with is French, and then they have Canadian French, because after my 20 years in Quebec City, I thought, well, it's not that different, but probably the accent. Uh, the accent is certainly a little bit different, but it's got so much more than if people that are used to using Duolingo when you're waiting in line at the grocery store, mm -hmm. whatever, whenever you're going to be using it. This really has a lot more. It's very contextual. It has cultural things also, but it will compare um, English, because it's, you know, it's for English, these languages are to learn for an English speaker, and it'll have like the, um, the, now, the subject of each one in red and then the verb in another color. And it really seems like you could advance quicker than in other programs I've seen. So I'm very happy to offer it to patrons of New London. So this is for people that want to travel, that maybe are going to Japan or Iceland. Everybody wants to go to Iceland these days. Whatever. <laughs> but the other thing it has is English is a second language, 17 programs for English as a second language, oh. specifically for Portuguese people, obviously. It's Turkish, Spanish, Greek, German, French, Chinese, two kinds of Chinese. Um, Creole, which could perhaps be you know, helpful here. Korean. Yeah, very. Mm -hmm. Right. A lot of, well, I, I, it's funny that you mentioned that the Creole because when you were reading the, the different kinds of French, you know, French and French Canadian, I was thinking, well, in New London, we have a lot of people who mm -hmm. speak Haitian Creole. We do, yes, right. And uh, one of the women who's working with the immigrant families asked us to get this a few months ago. And I, I was a little nervous about the price, but I thought, well, we're going to try it for a year or two and see if it gets used enough, because you always have to try something for sure. more than a year. And we'll, we, you know, I did put it in our budget for the city, and I'm hoping that they will agree that it is a well-spent money. Because not everybody can go to classes that when adult ed offers it. They've got wonderful classes, but the way people are working with different part-time mm -hmm. jobs, stitching things together, I think, I'm sure it's going to be well used. And there seems to be a lot more variety in languages available than adult ed classes. Right, exactly. Right, it's, it's very difficult to find teachers of, let's say, Arabic or Azerbaijani or right. things like that, and yet you can take those languages at your own pace. So that's also a, a big plus. Right. And it keeps track of your learning levels. Right. Two staff people already decided this. We just got it today that they're going <laughs> to learn Italian together and encourage each other. I thought that's, really that's wonderful. Great. And right. then next year will be the vacation in Italy, right? <laughs> I go for that. Yeah, yeah it, it would be a great incentive. Right. So, so how does a person access that? You just go into the library? You need to have a library card, and you mm -hmm. can access it through our website. We haven't done the push yet for it. This is the first time we've talked about it, but we'll be going out. We plan to have a group uh, a meeting at the library if you want to come and have a hands-on demonstration. Mm -hmm. You don't need that. It's very self-explanatory, but we'll be doing that. Anybody that comes to a class at the library gets their fines ex 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 uh, ex forgiven. excused. Yeah. yeah, yeah. We like to do that as little incentives for people. So we're looking forward to it. I I can't wait, actually. It's exciting to have something new. Well, that sounds fun. I have to think what language I want to learn, <laughs> where I'd like to travel. That all sounds. Um, I did just want to say one more thing before we talk about our services, which is that we have museum passes. And I thought, if anybody wanted to guess how many museum passes we had, and I guessed correctly, you could come in and take two books off the new book, off, not the new bookshelf, our, our used bookshelf, where we get some nice books. So if anybody knows how many museum passes we have at the New London Library, please call here. Okay, and we'll put the phone number up, and we will answer the phone if you call, if you have a guess um, about the number of passes, or if you have any questions or comments about the show in general. This is live, so call away. We'll see if anyone's listening to call. That's right. Right. We, they're very popular, especially any school vacation every weekend. We have uh, two state park passes, but it just counts as one for how many we have. But we will have two this summer, and that saves a lot of money at Harkness or Rocky Neck. Well, it's fantastic. When I worked as a preschool teacher, especially when I worked for Head Start as a home visitor, and 
a lot of what the families needed was to get hooked up with our local resources. Um, one of the things we always did, or almost always did, was go to the library, and the passes were often like the incentive that really grabbed them. Mm -hmm. I, they were okay with borrowing books and borrowing mo movies, but it was really those museum passes that like got them over that, that, that whatever barrier it was to go get the card. Great. Mm -hmm. Great. We could talk a bit of, we could talk about the programs that we offer. Yes. 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 Yeah, in fact, I see mm -hmm. you brought a calendar, uh, a, a calendar of events, and, oh. you know, I just wanted to note, I went on the, you know, website, and it's a packed calendar. There's always something going on there. Always something going on at our library. This is, this is so packed full, as you can see. You know, there, there is very little downtime for anything there. But let's see, today is the 8th? No, today's the 7th. Tomorrow's the 8th. Tomorrow's the 8th. So at 4 p.m. tomorrow, there are violin lessons. That's one of the oh. things we hadn't oh, talked yeah. about. Yeah. Oh, that's one of the highlights. Violin and cello lessons by the Community Orchestra of Quebec Free and New London Kids are Prioritized, which is great. And it's just so wonderful. Mm -hmm. The families are there. Our, our lower level is just full with kids, and it's just heartwarming to see them come in. And, you know, they lend, they lend the kids the instruments, and the teachers are wonderful. The kids get to take the instruments home. Yes. Oh, yes. Yeah. Free of charge. A yeah. violin well, is not an easy thing to yeah. get for a child, um, but they they do that for us. And music is so important. I've, I've read that music, studying music is really good for your math skills, too. Yeah, oh, in fact, it's better than studying math directly in the younger oh, really? grades. Oh, okay. Yeah, and they, they, they've done research that like computer you know, education in the early grades is not nearly as good as music for developing math skills. Boy. So yeah, music is really uh, important. And I remember when the community orchestra uh, was started, because, oh gosh, it's like at least 10 years ago, the Peace and Justice Network would have film series, and we had one film about the Venezuelan oh, youth yes, orchestra, yes. and mm. Tom Clark was so inspired by that film that he kind of got the ball rolling on getting a community orchestra started here. So it's fantastic to see that you know, it's evolved and it's reaching more kids. Yeah. They had a concert last spring with members from the community orchestra and the kids that had taken lessons. It was just so wonderful. At St. Mary's Church, right, because church have such, churches have such good acoustics. It was right across, across the street from the library. It was really great. There's something wonderful about playing in a big group of, you know, musicians. Yeah. Well, in addition to the violin lessons tomorrow, the chess club meets at 4 p.m. That's and probably also good for your math skills. We'll it's pitch it's math wonderful for all kinds of skills. And it's a great group that comes in that uh, does that with the kids. Now they do sometimes, do they bring the full-size chess pieces? We haven't done that yet. We did that at my last job. The, the London Day came in and took that great picture of a, a young, maybe eight or nine-year-old head there and the guys playing because mm -hmm. the children can come in and play you know, with their, parent, their parents with them. And the mom was there with the baby in the stroller. They just learn a lot by watching before they're even ready to play. It's very popular on Wednesdays. Right, and the adults are, are very willing and eager to have the wow, kids join that's great. in. They, they just love giving that information to youngsters. And occasionally there are youngsters who get good enough, fast enough, that they are pretty good competition. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so that's, that's what's on the docket for tomorrow, besides the usual things, uh, homework helpers at 4 o'clock. Right, that's, um, yes. And, and so on. So it's, it's a pretty full day for a day that we're only open half a day. We don't open till 1 o'clock on Wednesdays, which is one of the things that we would like to change, but it all costs money. Yeah, well, this is a little bit of a diversion, and we'll get back to programs, but uh, I think if I personally had anything I'd like to see improved in the library, it's more hours. Mm -hmm. So how do we get he from here to there because I know the issue is financial. Well, we were open, our low point was 48 hours a week, and now we added five this year. 
So by opening Saturday all day instead of limited hours and Sundays, not all year yet. So that's some added hours, but it's, it's absolutely the budget. It's just the budget. Um, we're aiming, we, we would like the library to get one penny of every one dollar from the municipal budget that's spent, or like for taxes yeah. or where the money comes together. Mm -hmm. It would seem like a reasonable amount. That's below the state average, but one penny. When we started our, our you know, asking for money. Right, was that was for, two years ago, three, three years, years ago. ago. We were at three quarters of a penny for mm -hmm. every dollar. And that's not what you pay for your taxes. It's not much when you consider. So now we're up to 0.8 of a penny. So we're moving, 0.89, so that's almost 0.9. We're getting. The city council does what it can for us. Right. Yeah, I was uh, going to big, ask what the prognosis is. We're, we're in well, getting, heading into budget season. And if you've gotten any word yet about what kind of support you might be seeing in the next fiscal year. Well, everybody supports us in principle. Who's against the library? Nobody's against the library. Where the rubber meets the road is when it's time to parcel out who gets what and where is the money going to come from. It's the same as in any municipality. So maybe we'll have a, a little fortunate year this year. Maybe the tax rolls are up a little bit. We'll have to see. Um, a lot of things that happen in the city are things that we can't control. Fortunately, right. we didn't have a very terrible winter, so right. we didn't spend a lot of extra money on snow yet, let me say that, knock on wood. Yeah, really, it's only March. Um, but um, those are things that, that can't be controlled, and the, all of the counselors that we've ever talked to have always been committed and supportive of the library. It's just sort of one of these, where can we find it? And we are trying to do the best we can to up our own fundraising, but it's very difficult. Uh, the amount of money that we would have to raise is a tremendous amount. And um, the, the city council is the one place that does really support us well. Um, we couldn't run without them. Oh my goodness, no, absolutely uh, not. It's, uh, it's our, obviously our main 85%. Last year we had a 5% increase and we were able to inc do, you know. That's right. Add the some hours and also the, the Shea Foundation. So we're, we were hoping Five, you know, to get at least five percent, but I don't. I really don't know. We know that the difficulty. We don't. Yeah, there yeah. are a lot of challenges, but it seems, and it seems as though the city might value the library, but more and more, like these public institutions, uh, I don't know. They're they're getting less and less valued in general by our society. If you look at national or state spending, it seems like those quality of life things sometimes take a, a back seat to more like literal roads infrastructure and that kind of thing even though i'm sure the return on the investment for the library is huge well yes sure. um, i think that our last figure was we return four dollars of value for every one dollar that's invested in us and that was several years ago um, it's nice to be able to say that but on the other hand with a qualitative product, if you want to call it a product, right. that the library provides, you, you can't put a dollar yeah. value on it. And it's much like education. You don't know what you're going to do with this one child who's five years old today right. that will have an echo effect all the way down the line until they grow up and become Richard Wright or right. um, Bernard yeah. Shaw or somebody else who spent most of their life in a library because they couldn't stand school uh, or those kinds of things. We just don't know. We have no idea at all. Um, and it's especially important now. A lot of people feel like, well, nobody needs the library anymore. I can get books on my phone or my Kindle or something right, like that. Right, internet but, research is but, um, ubiquitous. Not everybody has those facilities. And there is something to be said for children's pictures books. Are you going Absolutely. to read? Good night, moon, with your child on, on an iPad. Maybe you will, but you know that there's a big difference between that and having the book in front of you right. and letting the child turn the pages. So uh, there are a lot of reasons to keep library facilities, traditional library facilities, available for those who maybe wouldn't have them otherwise 
we're talking about folks who don't have print rich environments right. at home and so on. So it's very, very important. And we might tend to forget it because it's not important necessarily in our lives, but we have to stop and think about those who don't have those right. opportunities. And that's a real responsibility that we have. And that was something I was so aware of when I was working for Head Start because many of the families, they were either, they were all low income, but many of them were immigrant families. And this mm -hmm. is something that you know, we're talking about today also. And what they needed most was to know what, what resources were available for them. They were in many ways very self-sufficient families, but they didn't know what the community had to offer. And the library was just a fantastic place for them. We track our reference questions, the kind of questions we were asked, and it's almost up to 3,000 since J July 1st, the beginning of the, our fiscal year, and now of the number of questions about service, social services that were, get asked at our reference desk, a huge number for, for things like that. So we really are a place to give that kind of information, for sure. We're actually starting now, Jeannie Milstein came in January. Once a month we're having someone come and speak about social services, different aspects of it. On a Wednesday, when we open at 1 o'clock on Wednesday, it's a stampede to come in mm -hmm. the library. So we're having it like 1.30 on Wednesdays with coffee, right in the reading room, because yeah. gone are the days where you couldn't like breathe. You just have right. to sit there, coffee, nothing, you know, what's that going to do if a little bit spills? Just to offer that and have, um, it was very popular when she came. A lot of people had a lot nice. of questions. So that hopefully that will be, a, that is an ongoing program we're going to have now to answer some of those 2,700 questions wow. that we had. Um, and we also have bilingual, um, well, we also have books in other languages too. Oh, yes, besides Spanish. Right. Spanish, of course. Children's books as well as adult books. Um, and we try to represent the different language groups that come to us, but that takes time. Yeah. And, and also it takes some sort of um, recommendation on the part of our patrons to tell right. us what, which, language. Which, which things they need, so. I'd be curious about that. I, I know during my Head Start years, there was one year that I think I had 11 students in five different home languages, mm -hmm. and they were, you know, a lot of Urdu, and I had one family, you know, that spoke Gujarati, right. and they, they came from all over the place. And uh, New London, I don't think we have quite the number of, of languages as Hartford does, or mm -hmm. as maybe Norwich, Norwich does near the right. casinos, but we have a lot of languages in they our community. They do track community. it at the school, and it's surprisingly high. Yes. yes. I don't know if they all, I don't think we get everyone at the library from all the, I wish we did no. all those. We do have a bilingual story time. Yes. Yeah. We're taught by Margarita Hernandez, and it's, it's in Spanish for the Spanish children, but a surprising number of our families, are, they want their kids to learn Spanish. Mm -hmm. So it works both ways. She's just wonderful. It's, it's well, you know, bilingualism or multilingualism really is the wave of the future. I mean, it was the wave of the past, I think, <laughs> that a lot of people lived in small communities and knew one language at home and then spoke learn the state language Absolutely. in school. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we've kind of lost that skill in the United States for the most part, and I think we are poorer for it. For sure, yeah. A lot of uh, us had grandmothers that we couldn't really speak to. I had a great I grandmother who never learned English. Yeah, I did never too. Never learned it. Yeah, my grandmother, paternal grandmother, never learned English well. She spoke some kind of amalgam of Yiddish and English and Polish and uh, and so I could not really speak to her very well. But we could feel their love. We could. Right. I remember when she... <laughs> but there were no deep conversations. No, and yeah. there weren't any opportunities much for them in those days. A woman like that didn't have a, an opportunity to get outside the home. There weren't classes right. for well, them. But the, the grandpas learned English. Well, they yes, worse. they were. Yeah, that's they, very they were true. Yeah. Um, and so on. But um, no, it, it just didn't happen. But that's not the case any longer. There are lots of opportunities now, and there's more openness about it to not just learn a new language, but to preserve that home language, too, so that you don't lose track of where you are and where you came from. Right, and I think it's good for your brain, actually, to be able to, to process more than one language 
at you know from a young age. Well, I think it helps our kids thinking be more flexible. Kids in Switzerland grow up speaking how many different languages? Yeah, three they're not, without even thinking about they're it. They're not right? smarter than our kids in the United States are. They just have more opportunity to learn it. That's all. And it's just a very yeah, very factual thing. You say it this way or you say it that way. How many ways can you say no to a kid? You can say it in a lot of different <laughs> languages. You can. When I lived, I lived in Quebec City, where only 3% oh, yeah. of the population were native English speakers at mm -hmm. that time. This is right after college. I had my four kids, and so they all, they all went to French school, and their friends were French, so there were very few. Right. In, so when they would come home with their little friends and all, it was fine, but when it was just them, they, 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 if they're together now, they'll speak French, but I would have to say English at home, English at home, because you know you just have to protect that other language mm -hmm. or else it gets assimilated into the... Yeah, so language. close to home, yeah, in, in Quebec. Of uh, course, in Montreal, everyone knows Montreal, both. Yeah, yeah, it's more cosmopolitan, for sure. Now, before we got sidetracked a little, you were talking, wanted to start talking about some programs. Oh, well, let's show those flyers that we have. Uh, the, the color, the uh, posters, the under here. Oh, the local one. Authors yes, Fest. Local. This, let's show that everybody that. This is a great event coming this Saturday. We have 55 plus plus local authors coming on Saturday, September wow. 11th, between 11 and 2. It's un unbelievable. It's our second year. We did it last year. We didn't have, obviously, near as many. And Madhu Gupta, the head of reference, has organized it. It's going to be great. And it, it's going to wow. be right in the main floor of the library. The children's authors on that side. The tables are all set around. It's going to be so exciting. The, the UU Church has offered to let people park there. Um, there's, there's, four, there's four speakers, wow. also featured speakers, but it should be wonderful. It was a great time last year. And something new is we're having a few um, gift certificates. If you buy a book there, you get to get a raffle ticket, and then we'll give the raffle tickets for a few general gift certificates for patrons, for the public yeah. that comes. So we're, that's super exciting. And then the that's next... That's this Saturday. That, oh, well, I was going to ask you, 55 authors sounds like really a lot. It does. Are they... From the region in general, or do we have that many local authors? Well, it's not just New London. We expanded a yeah. bit going up and down the shore a little bit. Yes, absolutely. And the Hartford Current had it in their um, book column on the, on the oh. weekend and advertised it. And this is the next thing. This is also the second year. The Edible Book Festival. Festival. Okay, what is that? I've got to I ask. Know. Well, if you look carefully, you can see the very oh. hungry caterpillar. Ah. That uh, one last year, I think. Yeah. That, and that is um, a bunch of different kinds of finger foods arranged in the classic caterpillar. Yeah. So you take style. the title of a book and, and make it out of, make something that represents the book out of food. It was so popular last year. Well, this April, April 1st, this is in a couple Saturdays, and you make it at home and you bring it in um, and show it, and then there's judging. Well, no, there's actually, the, it's voting, I think, to, to figure out who wins, and then you, it doesn't get eaten there. You don't, you know, you can keep your cake. <laughs> there's all sorts of prizes for the contestant. It's, um, yes, we had one person do a very arty book last year. It was, it, yeah, it's very exciting. It's creativity, unbelievable. It's a lot of fun. You can see there are some peeps here with um, pretzels and something. I don't know. Yeah, that one's es escaping me what that one was. You, you was, need to register for it, but you don't have to say what book you're doing when you register. You, you just, just give it your name. name. Yeah, to, at least for now. And then the, you need to know like a few days before so we can make all the labels. But great program. How many participants did you have last year? Oh, I walked, I looked at it, but maybe 15. We're hoping for more. There might have been 20, yeah. you know. Yeah, that was great. They were charming, too. It, it, when you looked at them, you could pretty much guess what the book title was if you knew a little bit about yeah, books. Right. Uh, none of them were real esoteric in their, their backgrounds. But no, people chose books that people, that people, that people knew. would know. Oh, yes, and here's another thing coming up to Taxes Day. Oh. Um, we have a Shred It Day, a free community Shred It Day. Yes. So you bring all of your things that need to be shredded, oh, yeah. all of I your need one of those. bank statements and things that have broken your shredder because they're, 
there's too much stuff or you see it smoking a little bit because you've been doing too many things. So. You know, that's right. too real to me. I don't know how many shredders I've wrecked <laughs> trying to put in like eight sheets when it tells me it's only five sheets maximum because I know, me too. I want to get through the box faster. Mm -hmm. I have my parents and they had it for years and I had it like for three months and I burned out the thing. This, uh, this is sponsored by the Chelsea Groton Bank. And it's every year more and more people come because identity theft. We keep hearing so much about yeah. it. It's a really a, you know, a national concern. So it's one one thing you can do for yourself, reducing your risk for that. Or, yep. And it's easy to remember because it's a week before tax deadline. Oh, April eighth. Right. It parks right in our parking lot. You don't even mm -hmm. have to bring the things up the stairs. You can just pull it up your car and, uh, you know, carry it over. And, that's, and it's a big truck. And know. tax time is a perfect time, really, because you can kind of drop the old stuff. The off old ones, right. Off Not the this current year's ones, but, um, you know, all of the kinds of things they tell you that you should shred. So if you are like we are at home, we have boxes that we fill we, up, and then we just bring them for shred day so that we don't. I have not in the past, but I think I will start. Yes, yeah, it's a lot quicker. You just, it, you know, it's a commercial grade one, it just Sure, so I'm fast. sure it just... It doesn't burn it, out, like, <laughs> like, like the personal staples. ones. <laughs> right, or maybe <laughs> you're a little bit better about doing it as you go along than we are, but I we just not. kind of fling them into a, <laughs> a pile. Um, another thing that we have coming up is um, a Sanskriti. Yes, this is, oh, a fashion is, show. Oh, don't miss cool. this. This is going to be um, Indian. Indian women and men and some children. There's 20 women models modeling different types of saris from different parts of India. It should be just beautiful and they, and uh, also to talk about the culture in, of India. It's co-sponsored by uh, this group um, Sangam, which is about promoting in, uh, Indian culture in the States. You know, oh wow, do they have better. a local presence? Um, well, what? they're working with us on this. They do have a local presence, yes. And uh, just, oh yes, and the grand finale of the afternoon is going to be the brides, the bridal oh costumes my gosh. that she Ooh. wears. So I just lots of gold. Lots of gold, I bet, yes. We've had quite a few different cultural events this year, starting off with a, a fashion show with different textiles from South America that was co-sponsored with Expressiones. It, we had, it was wildly successful in our community room. That was great. Then we had Italian Month with a lot of mm -hmm. activities. And one of the high points was two chefs that came in and taught everyone how to make ricotta, ricotta or however, yeah. I don't know how people, <laughs> that was just so, so, uh, so wonderful. And you've just recently finished up your Black History Month activities. We did, but one of our films got bumped to March because of the weather, Lonnie Braxton, it, I think it's his seventh year. And it was a great film on uh, the 1938 Olympics, the Friday night Black History Month, yes. Black history America, is American history. Is but not always history. recorded very right. well. No, and not always very well known because there are lots of stories, for example, Hidden Figures, the um, yeah. movie that, that was so wonderful this year, stories that people didn't even know. So um, it's a great opportunity to learn a lot more about history, things that we may have lived through, but when you stop and think about it, uh, some of those films, I said to my husband as we went home, if you are younger than 60, you have no memory of any of this stuff that happened. So stop and think about that. That's almost three generations that right. wouldn't right. have known it. And even those well, of us o over 60, there were some perspectives that really weren't included right. in, oh, in our school curricula. Right. Yep. Well, when we think 1938 Olympics, Black yeah. History, we think Jesse Owens, but a lot of the part of the movie were the athletes that didn't get to go, that got cut before the black athletes, or two black athletes that were sent home because they were homesick and replaced by Caucasian. Just unbelievable things. And then, and then you had this story. Right. The um, I didn't two, know that one. two Jewish runners who were not allowed to compete because they put Jesse Owens and somebody else in that relay so that Jesse could win an extra gold medal. But uh, it was Marty Glickman. I don't know if you remember hearing about him. He became a great um, 
announcer, a sports announcer mm. after that. But he was a world-class runner, and he was denied the chance to run because he was Jewish, and they were afraid that it would upset Hitler if he ran. But the scenes so. of Hitler were re very, uh, mm -hmm. the Third Reich, just seeing it like that in the old films was sobering, to say the least. So well, and what you just said, it's like the government not wanting to upset Hitler. Like, I don't know, that's, that, that, that gives me pause because, mm -hmm. you know, what people, what leaders do we want to upset and which ones don't we want to upset? And it, it, it's supposed to be, the Olympics are supposed to be something that promotes brotherhood and all that kind right, of stuff. Right, outside of the political, right. governmental sphere. So there are all kinds of facts that you can learn at your library that you're right. not going to find on Google. <laughs> <laughs> and we have a lot of programs that we're breaking our, this year we're breaking our, our, our record for programs. We're happy about all those things. Yes, the attendance or the, um, what was the figure you had, Suzanne? 54% more oh, yes. uh, circulation in the children's department? Yes, from September through January for those months, this is after summer reading, circulation went up 53%. Now yeah. that's really high. It's so high that I went back to the figures and had somebody double check them because I thought there must have been an extra zero put on the end in one of the months, but they were all double checked. And a lot of the tribute of that goes to the children's staff because we're really stressing not just having one copy of the book mm. the kids want to read because like, like Adults, you want to read the bestsellers, but the kids sure. have their bestsellers, the series books that are hot. So we can't just have one or even two copies, because if a child comes in and wants a book, mm -hmm. you want to be able to put it in their sure. hands. So I think a lot of the targeted buying for things, I mean, obviously supporting the curriculum and what titles are on the list, but also cause just reading for kids is good. It doesn't have to be exactly great, you know, Right, secret guard classic kind of thing. So I think that really made a difference and having enough copies. So we've had our annual giving. It's been fairly successful. Mm -hmm. It's about, about 13,000. I think it? we've taken in about 13,000, which is still 7,000 shy of what our goal is. Uh, we never seem to be able to quite reach our goal of $20,000 a year. So if you're out there and you haven't given yet to the Public Library of New London, uh, we encourage you to give. If you've already given, please don't feel that you can't give again. <laughs> <laughs> well, especially uh. now, we really want those shelves to be full for the summer, full of books that the kids want to read, books that are on the summer reading list, and lots of books that they want. Because we know about, and you can talk about the summer slide that happens. Yes, um, a lot of educators are always concerned about getting the kids to a certain spot in June or May and then the kids go off for the summer and by the time they come back they mm -hmm. quote unquote lose uh, learning. And what they have found is that that's maybe not the case with your upper socioeconomic groups because those kids have parents that take them places and give them lots of educational experiences and there are probably lots of books in mm -hmm. the home itself. Where it falls down is in your language learner um, kids and um, homes where there isn't a lot of print material available and those are the folks that we kind of want to keep moving right. along so that there isn't that backslide so the one place that everybody can access that can help with that is the library the library is sort of like the unofficial summer school for everybody it's the unofficial adult ed for everybody it's where you go when you've finished your, your normal right. schooling. So we are hoping to do something to help with that, with um, the summer reading list that the, that the school system puts out, or anything. You know, you don't have to have a summer reading list to read during the summer. No, and in fact, the goal is to get kids to really value reading to the point that, you know, every day they're just reading. Right, do it for fun. Something for Not fun. Because yeah. It's not because somebody says you have to do it, but because you want to do it. So that's important to do. So we would really like, to, there's a place you can give right online. Even if you've given, you could give it maybe a few more dollars to make sure those children's stats can keep up that high during the summer. Mm -hmm. It's right on our annual giving page, and we're hoping um, 
to make sure we have enough books on our shelf for You can the give through PayPal. Season. You can pay okay. through PayPal. Right. Um, or send a check. Yes. Cash makes no enemies. <laughs> <laughs> so, so how else can people Small bills. Uh, <laughs> be supportive of the library? Well, to use our facilities, of course, that's, that's the most important thing. Uh, we do have volunteer services, volunteer right? Volunteer opportunities, yeah. if you're interested. Uh, support the book sale that's coming up May 20th, the Friends of the Library book sale. The, the, that money comes back to the library. There's an ongoing book sale all the time, yep. um, which is in the you know the book nook we call it. That's a good way. Now, are um, you looking for um, people to donate books still for the book? Absolutely. Oh, yes. When you do your spring cleaning, you know, take those books off the shelf, put them in a box, bring them to the library. Maybe on shredding day, you have one box will, to shred and one box of books to donate. Yes. Yep. We'll see to it that um, they get kind of looked over and other people have an opportunity to buy them for really reasonable prices but it does make quite a bit of money and it brings people into the library to look. Um, we also accept um, CDs, and DVDs. CDs and DVDs, not VHS mm -hmm. anymore. No, but. Um, nobody has the equipment to <laughs> right. use, it isn't that use easy them. To play but, a VHS. Um, those are the kinds of things and then there are um, usually the friends have a white elephant table with different kinds of um, little knickknacks and things that are usually quite interesting and very nice condition. So there's all kinds of reasons to come. Now we have five minutes left and I wasn't sure if there was anything that we had forgotten, but if there isn't, I thought you could talk a little bit about the Nonprofit Resource Center because we haven't really oh, talked yes. about uh, we, it, but important. I have used it. <coughs> we didn't really do all our general services, such no, as No, we that, didn't. We didn't. Local history. No. Local history, yep. The history and genealogy room. You have a notary. Uh, the oh, in the notary public. Notary, yep. The, available uh, in Spanish as well. Um, so we have a, we had a great, we had a donation to buy sewing machines. Our sewing classes are so popular right off the wall for that, the, 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 the New London Day, access to the New London Day back issues. Oh, that's right, the back issues of the New London Day. Uh, even the day itself doesn't have um, the extensive library well, of it they that send we people do. to us. We get yep. requests from all over the country. Mm -hmm. And we do charge anybody outside the state $25 to mail them things because yeah. it, takes, sure. it definitely takes time to do the research. And uh, we have our citizenship corner, a small yep. citizenship corner. Um, We're trying to digitize uh, some of the photos that we have in our historic collection as well that are interesting to people. As you say, people will request things from far away and wonder why we don't have them available online and that's one of the things we're trying to do so that they can get copies of them and uh, for a fee they can use them. And one of our signature programs is the 1,000 Books Before Kindergarten and for the children, trying to encourage all families to read that many books to their kids before they go to school. We have a whole wall of the library um, dedicated to that in the children's room, but we still, we're still working on this. We still would need to have um, some more people from the community help us promote this mm -hmm. to make sure that every child in New London is enrolled in this. That's a great way to volunteer. Okay. To volunteer to yeah. read. Volunteer to read. The Nonprofit Resource Center won a, won a prize from the Foundation Center for our community programs and our community outreach. It's really extraordinary. Mm -hmm. We have one major program a month. Tom Ahern will be coming next, and then there's constant database trainings in there. The Community Foundation helps us support that, and it's very popular. It draws people from all of southeastern Connecticut. So in our last minute and a half, uh, so. I guess we should tell people, most people in New London know where the library is, but maybe we should like, tell them and then tell them how they can find out more. Well, it's at the corner of State Street at the very top and Huntington Street, and you probably drive by it if you're going anywhere in New it's London. It's really convenient. When I had a class at St. James, we used to walk to the library all the time. Mm -hmm. So it's in a great place. It's in a historic building. Mm -hmm. It's in an iconic building. You probably are familiar with the three arches. Uh, right. We did have t-shirts with it on it. You can come there and you can come to the library and, and get one. 
Yeah. Uh, I decided not to wear my T-shirt tonight. I decided it was yeah, I wanted to show me not uh, formal yeah. enough. But at any rate, um, we it's could have used it as a backdrop, but yes, we kind of yeah. missed out. On it's that. a hard, hard building to miss, and you can enter it either from the Huntington Street side or around from the parking lot side. So there are lots of ways to access it. That's for sure. And if the doors are kind of heavy to pull, which I find. You can just press the automatic <laughs> door button and it will open up for you. And there's 25 parking spots. Yes, Lots 25 parking, parking right. spots, which frequently are pretty well full. So you have to kind of be careful, um, come there. But um, certainly we are more than willing to have folks come in either side of the, the entrances. Yeah. Well, thank you, Suzanne. And thank you, Deneen. I'm glad we finally got a date together. All of you, go to the library. There's always something going on. And uh, next week, our guest will be Cheryl Molina. She's with Start Fresh. It's the group that's helping Syrian refugees relocate here and get housing. So good night for now. And hopefully, we'll see each other at the library. Yes, I hope so. Great. Thanks very Thank much, Ron. Thank you. Thank